in Kazakhstan, we um we went looking for it. We came across it on the internet, and um, we found a abandoned. We thought it was a missile silo, but it, it was an ex-Soviet rocket facility that had just been abandoned. And there was loads of it was huge, absolutely massive, huge satellite dish. Uh, loads of data all over the floor. You could see where massive machines had been. They're just ripped out of the wall. It was absolutely incredible and fascinating. We were walking around there and we ran into some um, metal workers. Um, they were collecting the scrap metal and the concrete and they'd take that away to be recycled. And um, then we went back to the car because there was a bit of an uneasy feeling. Like they really had the gypsy vibe and um, could have gone either way where uh you know we weren't sure if knives were going to be pulled out or they were going to try break into the the ambulance or not and um anyway so we went back and security's there we're like wow okay it's this this place is abandoned but it's got security so there are these two guys they didn't look you know like your standard security they were kind of burly and they're kind of casually laying back and they're looking at the ambulance looking in it and they're watching us come up and then they're just looking at the sunset Anyway, we get up to them, they're like, you, no here, no here. We're like, okay, they're like, you go, you go. We're like, pictures, can we take pictures? They're like, yes, come, come. <laughs> and so they escort us around, and we got to take pictures of the whole facility. <laughs> and then um, they, their English was a bit broken. The metal workers actually had better English. So the first opportunity they get, they're like, how about you, escort, escort, go, do. And so this metal worker takes us around the whole facility and we're climbing up like really, really dangerous stuff and um, make our way across floors where massive sheets of concrete had dropped away. There are like five-story holes all the way to the bottom. He's like, beware, beware, cobras, cobras. We're like, we're Australian, it's fine. Snakes, they're like pets, like whatever. So we climbed our way up to the satellite dish and we got to look around there and um, had a few photos taken of the sunset and then we, we said our goodbyes, gave a little bottle of uh, vodka to them and, um, and made our way on. And um, so we get into town and we find a mechanic that couldn't fix it and this guy is absolutely lovely guy but he had um, had a couple of drinks and um, anyway he's like really really passionate and he's like come with me, come with me. And he took us to one mechanic, and they couldn't help us at all. Um, but then he's like, oh, look, I know some guys that, that they built my Jeep. It took two months, but you might have to wait o overnight for them to repair your car. Anyway, so we followed him around, and um, we got through all these back streets and everything. And we pulled in, and these guys were fantastic. We started talking to them, and they fixed the door. They, they fi took off a sidestep, which had been giving us a lot of problems. And um, did a couple of other things. They saw the bash plate that we put on. And they were impressed. They were like, wow, you guys did a good job of putting on the bash plate. Because they could see it was a DIY bash plate. And um, so we did all that. And they heard that we were doing this um, this cause for orphans. And that the ambulance was being donated. And they were amazing. They are like, oh, you don't owe us anything. Give it all to the kids. Give it all to the kids. So we were really overwhelmed by their generosity and um so they're really really nice guys and um so we drove off and we headed towards Novosibirsk and got there and um so instead of a Starbucks we pulled into what was called Lennon Street Coffee Shop we had a good time on the internet there and just updating everything and and basically catching up on a few days work and headed off from there to Lake Baikal which is absolutely stunning, beautiful. Uh, the temperature of the water was about two degrees. We um, had a few swims in it for uh, both hygiene and uh, fitness reasons. And um, anyway, we then left there and because the ambulance is an emergency vehicle, we had to, we had no other option but to enter from the north uh, border um, as opposed to the western one which a lot of the cars came through and they go through the Golby Desert and have about a five day crossing from there um, which funnily enough a lot of cars when you enter from the western border it breaks up and there are all these different paths so you either get lucky or you get unlucky and if you take the more southern path 
it takes you across a river where the river crossing you have to go through the river and a lot of cars actually went underwater and had fuel tanks ripped apart and this kind of stuff so we um, obviously couldn't do that being an ambulance and so we entered from the northern border um, the northern border crossing took about 19 hours um, we started we got there about 11:30. they were actually shut they shut I think around about 10 o'clock, 9 or 10 o'clock, and then they don't open till about, it was 8 a.m. So we had to sleep at the border in the car, and we are going on shifts, guarding, and, and all that kind of stuff. And um, we got across, and then it's really involved in putting the car. They have to know so many details, and they're about three staff members, and they don't really, they, they were lovely, lovely, and very helpful, but they um they were not as proactive as you'd like and um, so Adalbert ended up jumping behind the desk and on their computer looking at Facebook while getting you know a few of, of the um, the ambulance details together and we managed to cut down our time and apparently we got across one of the quickest um, a lot of people had two three days that it was taking them to get across um, and obviously they had smaller cars and it should have been a lot more straightforward for them but um Anyway, we got across after also being told off for playing um, a game of soccer in the, the car park there. And um, we went to get our insurance, because we're used to it by now. Um, except they were trying to rip us off $40. It normally cost about $12. Um, but we got across, and then we made our way down to Ulaanbaatar. Um, and got in there late at night. It, driving there, night time was worse. They had their high beams on, their massive potholes you can't see because this guy's shining his high beams, you're on this tiny road. It was just shocking, so um, that was probably the worst driving that I've done, actually, on the trip. But um, nevertheless, we got through it, we pulled in, went to the Ulaanbaatar Hotel, stayed the night there, and because um, we figured we'd just have a treat, a few creature comforts, you know, um, like a bed. And... Um, and then we went to the finish line, registered the car, and caught up with everybody, shared stories, and um, the next day we then, um, uh, Neil picked up a, the tummy bug again, unfortunately, so we rushed him to the hospital, um, and he then spent the next day in bed, and we went to the orphanage, and we had an amazing time. The orphanage is on the outskirts of the town, and it's probably an hour drive mainly because the traffic's so bad like they just get con so congested you know there's no order to the traffic there the five cars try to weave their way through at once even through the oncoming traffic and there's potholes and people come out of side streets and cause further delays and so we got out to the orphanage and um, saw the facilities the medical center looks great um, but very sparse and so we took a huge couple of boxes of supplies and they were extremely grateful for that and then we went out and saw the kids who were at a summer camp um, and to get to the summer camp the actual bus had to stop and then you had a trek about three k's over, up over hills down to a valley got to their girls and as soon as we got there the kids come running out and start climbing all up you grab your cameras they want you to take photos of them they turn around on you they want to take photos of you it was just amazing they're just wonderful wonderful kids and um despite you know their harsh lives and and um you know background stories they were just they warmed your heart you just play with them the girls were saying that they haven't seen um, guys like um, Adalbin and I play for so long, like six hours of constantly picking one kid up and one of the other, just like having them jump around, all that kind of stuff. So it was great. And um, we had to leave them, say our goodbyes, and we gave them all these uh, um, caramella koalas and little clip-on koalas and all that kind of stuff. So they all loved it. And then um, the next day we... Uh, had to do some further cleaning of the ambulance. Neil got to see them again because a few of them came over to dance. And um, then we we did a few things like the riding of the Mongolian horses and holding the hunting eagles and all that kind of stuff. So um, all in all, it went down very, very well. And as I said before, the the fact that we were able to raise enough money to keep one kid going for four years was so touching and uh, it felt like a real accomplishment.
Dylan, welcome home! Thanks guys, it's so good to see you all. It's so good. Finally alive and in our civilization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some crunchy comforts. Yeah. Crunchy comforts and yes. love. Yeah. So, okay. Oh, yeah, that. Dark. <laughs>